Glory to Jesus Christ. So I can't tell you how many times I've been asked two questions. Father, what is the Orthodox Church? I get that one a lot. And how does a person become Orthodox? I can also say that people who ask these questions come with a whole variety of assumptions about what those questions might mean. Everything from people who um, think orthodoxy is like kind of chill and just fun and kind of like neat and cool. People who um, are convinced if you're not orthodox, you're going to burn in hell forever, like this guy. Or uh, other, other people that sort of think orthodoxy is a cool flavor of Christianity, uh, sort of not different really from the other types, but... What a nice, respectable part of the Christian family. We might call this the branch theory of kind of ecclesiology, which is pretty common uh, for most Christians. And, and we can talk more about that later. So what I'm hoping to do tonight is to clarify, using a variety of sources, what the Orthodox Christian Church believes about the church. Specifically, what we believe about the Orthodox Church. Now, there's a complicated problem. When the Orthodox Christians talk about the church, it can be confusing because most of the time we're speaking about the Orthodox Church, but there are other Orthodox Christians maybe who sort of speak about the church in a vaguely Christian sense. I mean, if you know people at Asbury, they talk about the church and they mean it in a very broad kind of way. But even how we speak about the church is important to be precise because um, that imprecision can be, can be confusing for a lot of people. When we talk about joining the Orthodox Church, how do we actually do that, practically speaking? Um, and drilling down deeper, we'll ask the question, how does the Orthodox Church relate to those coming to her from other Christian bodies? And how does our policy of entry to those groups, perhaps, speak about how we see the Orthodox Church vis-a-vis -vis these other groups? So these are some of the questions we'll consider tonight. Um, and all of these questions would speak about our ecclesiology. Uh, how we understand the ecclesia. Ecclesia means the church in Greek. So how we see the church, our theology of the Christian Orthodox Church. So I want to start with a very important question. Uh, one big question. How do men and women and children enter into the church and into Christ? Give me your answer. Baptism. Baptism. Very good answer. That is the answer. The answer is People enter into Christ via baptism. Very important point. St. Paul will say in his epistle to both the Romans and the Galatians, in words that most of us know well from the baptismal service, we sing it as a hymn. He says, as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Baptism is the entrance appointed for us into Christ and into the church, according to St. Paul. Uh, there is no other way to get into Christ other than baptism, unless maybe it's baptism in one's own blood, right? But otherwise, it is water baptism and a tripartite formula in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit um, in the church. This is the way. Um, later in the epistle to the Ephesians, St. Paul will emphasize strongly that baptism is a one-time event. He'll say in Ephesians 4, uh, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you were called, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body, one Spirit, uh, one, uh, even as you were called unto your one hope and calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all, through all, and in you all. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Very important point that St. Paul makes. Father Thomas Hopka writes the following about one baptism in his catechesis. I'm going to read a little bit of it. He says this, The way of entry into the Orthodox Christian Church is by baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. We read this at every baptismal service, right? The Gospel from Matthew 28, that the Lord gives the Great Commission to go into all the world and baptize. Father Thomas says this, Baptism as a word means immersion or submersion in water. It was practiced in the Old Covenant and even in some pagan religions as a sign of death and rebirth, a kind of proto-baptism you might say. Thus John the Baptist was baptizing as the sign of new life and repentance, which means literally a changing of the mind and so of desires and actions in preparation for the coming of the kingdom of God in Christ. In the church, Father Thomas continues, the meaning of baptism is death and rebirth in Jesus Christ. It is the personal experience of Easter given to each man, woman, and child. The real possibility to die, to be made, to, be, to be born again, as John 
His gospel will say, John 3, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him in baptism, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be made united to him in a resurrection like his. This is the reading uh, from St. Paul's Epistle to Romans that we read in the baptismal service. Father Thomas concludes, The baptismal experience is the fundamental Christian experience, the primary condition for the whole of all our Christian life. Everything in the church has its origin and context in baptism, for everything in the church originates and lives by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thus, following baptism comes the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit, the mystery of chrismation, uh, with, which is man's personal encounter of Pentecost, and then finally, he or she receives the Eucharist and the Holy Mysteries. So this is the normative kind of thing. We are baptized into Christ. We become Christians. And that is our inauguration, our death and rebirth into the life of Christ, into the life of the church. So now we have to kind of pivot here. So we have a very important saint named St. Cyprian of Carthage, who was martyred in the year 258. Uh, he's an important father of the mid-third century. He followed and amplified St. Paul's teaching, uh, identifying baptism as our beginning and uh, as life in the church. Um, St. Cyprian wrote a seminal work called On the Unity of the Church, and he very famously gave us a phrase that I think you all know. He said famously, you cannot have God as your father unless you also have the church as your mother. Hear that again. He said, you cannot have God as your father unless you have the church also as your mother. For St. Cyprian, the church was not an optional part of the gospel. Rather, it was, the, it was only in the true church of Christ, he believed, that grace could be found and only in the church that the sacraments could be obtained. This is interesting. He's very clear about this. For St. Cyprian, any baptism offered outside the church was nothing more than a washing. That's what he said. Any Eucharist outside the church was not a Eucharist, he said. According to St. Cyprian, it was necessary for anyone coming to the church from a schismatic Christian body to see that previous entity as graceless and to accept the true baptism from the church. This is what St. Cyprian taught very, very clearly. Um, all of this, by the way, is, is an expression of what the early uh, the theologians call Cyprianic ecclesiology. So the, 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 the theory of the ecclesiology of Cyprian is this kind of uh, hard shell church. The, the church is, 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 is differentiated very clearly from any other body. Uh, Father John Erickson, my, my dear professor from seminary, uh, uh, one of my canon law teachers said, um, the Cyprianic ecclesiology posits undifferentiated darkness. Either you're in the church and there's light, or you're outside it and it's total darkness. And that was kind of Cyprian's mind about these things. Um, and, and you find this Cyprianic approach pop up again and again in the history of the church, even by really holy, venerable men and women, which is, which is worth noting. Um, but with St. Cyprian, our own OCA speaks about the centrality of the church in our Christian experience. I'm going to just, re I'm trying to establish that Cyprian is not all crazy and he's an important voice for us. And there's a but coming. But, but listen to this about what our church, what we believe the church is all about. This is our Senate of Bishops writing in 1973. They said this, the Orthodox Church is the one indivisible church of Christ, not because of the works of men, but because by the grace of God expressed in the blood of the martyrs and the witness of the saints, the Orthodox Church has preserved to this day its God-given mission to be for the world the church which is the body, the fullness of him who filleth all things. There can be only one church, for Christ founded but one church. It is into this one church that we must all enter to live in perfect communion with God, with each other, and with all of creation." So this is the church, our church, our local OCA, echoing, in a sense, Cyprian's core conviction that the church is the pillar and ground of truth, that we need the church, and that the sacraments are found here in the church. It's very strong. I would submit to you today that how the church has processed St. Cyprian's teaching, though, is a fantastic example of how we interpret and understand the fathers of our church. In general... 
The Orthodox Church has received an important part of what Cyprian emphasizes, that the church is vital and necessary, that the fullness of life is in the church, that the church has a visible reality, that we can say here is the church, that we need the church for our salvation. All these things we, we and the fathers between him and us affirm very strongly. The fathers that came after Cyprian and, and our synod agree on these points. But, and here's the big but, but they also almost univocally between Cyprian and now, reject his hard view that schismatics must all be baptized anew. Almost univocally reject this point. Without proclaiming that other Christian bodies have grace, the fathers tend to accept that something authentic can be received into the bosom of the church and be healed. A very interesting point held next to St. Cyprian's teaching. So the real debate is what that process of healing or reception means, and that's really where we're going tonight. How do we, how do we talk about receiving a baptism or something outside the church and bringing it inside the church? How do we do that? Before we unpack more fully the question of reception of converts, I'd like to drill down more deeply into Orthodox ecclesiology itself, how we understand the church. And I'm going to draw extensively from a, a little talk that Father Hopko gave on ecclesiology about a decade ago. Father Thomas emphasizes that the issue of what is the church is one of the most difficult of topics that require significant examination of previously held assumptions. And of course, our entire Christian life involves, I mean, Jesus begins his preaching with repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We have to constantly reevaluate how we see things. Father Thomas emphasizes that the first thing to note in discussing ecclesiology is that in our ancient Nicene Creed, the church herself is an object of faith. Think about this. We believe in one God, the Father, one Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and we believe in the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. This is remarkable. The church is, is, is an object of faith. We believe in the church. And it is the... The ecclesia is, is the community established by God from the Old Covenant, even renewed on Pentecost, gathering, instantiating the very presence of God among the human race. The church is the union of faith and love gathered around where the real God of Israel reigns, where he rules and reigns. We believe that this ecclesia is not invisible. Um, we can look at every century and point out, here's where the church is, here's where it is, here it is, every century. We can see the church at work, we can say. So this community is alive and full of, of very imperfect people, people who have lots of problems, who are sinners. This, this community is Christ's body. It's a holy nation, a royal priesthood, the household of God, the pillar and ground of truth. The church is a real community that keeps the faith, that properly worships, that properly teaches about the truth of God. Um, the church is one holy Catholic and apostolic. And so this is really important. Um, Father Alexander Schmemann uh, famously said, and Father Hopko likes to quote this, the church is not an institution with mysteries, rather the church is a mystery with institutions. Hear that again. The church is not an institution with mysteries, the church is a, is a mystery with institutions. Of course, these institutions of the church are always creating temptations because fallible people are involved in those institutions. Father Hopko even says directly in his talk, the institutional church is a huge problem. He says this, just like, let's be clear, it's a huge problem. It's always in trouble. It's often persecuting the holy ones of God. Consider our Lord Jesus Christ, persecuted by the leadership of Israel. Consider Peter and Paul fighting. Consider St. John Chrysostom being, being persecuted by St. Cyril of Alexandria. Consider more recently... In the 20th century, St. John of Shanghai and San Francisco, who was mocked by so many other clergy and bishops for his fool for Christedness, or Mother Maria of Skopsova, who incurred the wrath of more proper church people because she was unconventional and risked her life in very strange ways for other people. Uh, people who are holy are often persecuted by the church. And Father Hopko likes to say, like to say, um, you've never known the way of Christ until you've experienced some kind of persecution from the church itself. So think about that. And, and look, um, as a priest, I, I've, some of my, my biggest points of grief have come from people in church. And I know that I've caused you grief too. And, and we're a relatively loving, healthy parish. But that, that's just the way it is. We call, we call people are people wherever you go. And there's always this struggle. 
Um, you've never suffered for Christ until you've known pain from the institutional church. So think about that. And think about, too, that um, if we translate you know, the scribes, the Pharisees, the priests into modern parlance, that would be the bishops, the priests, uh, the theologians, and the canon lawyers, right, and parish council members. That, that, that's be, that'd be like how we read uh, those verses in the New Testament. So we have a very honest view about the people in church. So there's always this tension within the church. Its doctrines are pure, we would say. Its liturgy is divine. And, but the people can drive you crazy, and they can be crazy. As Father George Florovsky famously said, uh, the true church is never the perfect church. It's good, isn't it? Or as Father Tom Galloway likes to say over and over again, the church is like the ark. It will save your life, but it stinks. There's that truth. So there we are. So uh, Deuteronomy and Revelation both warn against adding or taking away from the truth. And the Orthodox are very keen neither to add nor to subtract. Um, and of course, our, in polemics about the, the Roman Catholic Church, we'll, we'll note that they added things. And, and when we speak about some of the Protestant areas, we might comment that they, they, they've subtracted things from the apostolic faith. But we would say that the church is preserving and neither adding nor subtracting from the apostolic deposit of faith. And that's part of our belief about what the church is and what the church is doing. Um, so Father Hopko emphasizes that the church has a real breathing connection to the early church, that it is historical, it is flesh and blood. And he, he, he points out that you can't be the one true church without apostolic succession. Do you know what that is? Everyone know what that is? Apostolic succession um, involves the, 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 the theology that um, the early the bishops of the church trace their authority uh, to their spiritual father, who was a bishop before them, who ordained them. And then they trace back all the way to the apostles. This was articulated first by St. Irenaeus of Leon. And what we believe about apostolicity is that it is it is a real laying on of hands from one bishop to another, but also to be apostolic, you must preserve apostolic faith. Uh, you must have apostolic practice. You must preserve orthodox worship and maintain the unity of the Eucharist uh, with those around you. There was a group I, I know of uh, in my hometown of Jacksonville. They, they were reading their way in, into, the, into Christian apostolic traditions, and they, they were called the Charismatic Episcopal Church. Have you ever heard of them? And they believed in apostolic succession. So they, being Pentecostals who had vestments, they, they went and found a renegade bishop from South America. They flew him up, and they had him ordain all their, all their priests to be valid priests and valid, I think they ordained bishops too. And he laid hands on them, and they had this sort of like passing of the torch. Well, they had no intercommunion with any other churches. They had their own unique ideas, and you can't call that apostolic. It was sort of a fake apostolic. So... It has to be real. It has to be, be authentic. So uh, that's part of our ecclesiology, that we, the apostolic faith uh, must be passed down and held literally with the passing on, with the faith, with the, uh, the worship, and with the maintaining of Eucharistic communion uh, around the church. That's why the OCA, by the way, we send a metropolitan TCON around the world every year to communicate by communicate, I mean to have communion with different primates because it reaffirms our bond with all the other churches. And that is a major function of the primate in the world, ecclesiologically, to go and to celebrate the Eucharist with different primates and to unite the churches eucharistically. That's why when, it, when the churches break communion, it's a really big deal. And it's a great tearing of, 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 the, of the unity of the, of the, of the faith. So we, we don't want to do that unless there's a major reason to do it. So... It's worth saying, for all the chaos in world orthodoxy right now, I rejoice that our metropolitan is still in communion with every primate in the world. That's important to note. So let's talk about directly reception of converts throughout Christian history. As already mentioned, the centrality of baptism is our, in our understanding of entry into the church is paramount. It's the most important piece of the puzzle. The great 20th century canonist uh, Archimandrite Ambrosi Pagodin, who's a Russian canonist, points out that the most ancient canons we have from the pre-Nicene period make two key points that amplify the place of baptism. And here they are. Apostolic canon number 46 strictly forbids the bishop or presbyter to recognize heretical baptism. That's a point that's in the ancient canons. But there's another canon, number 47 of the same council, that equally 
forbids, strictly forbids the clergy to repeat a baptism over someone who has had an authentic baptism. These two canons appear to be in tension, don't they? They're in tension. And the questions that arise are, well, what makes a baptism heretical or inauthentic? And what makes a baptism authentic? Right? This is the important question here as we consider reception of converts today. The Russian Holy Synod, writing a couple hundred years ago, commented on Canon 47 that I just read. And they said, this apostolic canon refers to heretics in the time of the apostles who offended against the chief dogmas about God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and about the incarnation of the Son of God. In other words, heretics, the Russian church is saying, are those who seriously deform the gospel, who can, in our parlance, scarcely be called Christians uh, maybe they're Gnostics or other people. And just to pick on them again, sorry, the, the one group we can always point to are these guys. They, they really deform the gospel. It's a whole different kind of gospel. I think Christians agree on this. You know, we can like them, but what they're doing is not anything resembling the apostolic faith. And it's very clear their baptism is heretical by, by that parlance in the canons. Absolutely. And no Orthodox church, by the way, receives Mormon baptism as authentic. Not a one. An ancient local council held at Arles in France in the 4th century before Nicaea offered a radically different approach than St. Cyprian offered that I read about earlier and proclaimed that if some persons came from a schism into the church, then the clergy, and I quote, shall ask him to say the creed, and if they perceive that he was baptized into the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, he shall have hands laid upon him only that he may receive the Holy Ghost, but he who was not baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let him be baptized. So, so if they received an authentic baptism outside the church, let, let the presbyter lay hands upon him, confirm or chrismate that person, and then receive him into communion. If there was no baptism that was authentic, then let him be baptized. A very interesting canon, very different from what St. Cyprian is saying 50 years before. By the 4th century, we see an important ecumenical development in the approach to classifying those coming into the church who claim some kind of Christian baptism. The, the decisive legislation on this matter was put forth at the Second Ecumenical Council in the year 381. A very important council. It's you know, very early and very, a very decisive in canon law. And I'm going to read the seventh canon because it's good for you to hear the words of the ecumenical council uh, itself. So here's what it says in canon number seven. This is the ecumenical council at Constantinople, number two. Those who come over to orthodoxy and to the society of those who are saved, we received according to the prescribed right and custom. We receive Arians, Macedonians, Novationists, who call themselves the pure and the better. We receive Cordidecimans, otherwise known as Tetradites, as well as Apollinarians, on condition that they offer libelli, that is, they have to renounce in writing their heresies, and anathematize every heresy that does not hold the same beliefs as the Holy Catholic Apostolic Church of God. And then they should be marked with the seal, that is, anointed with the chrism on the forehead, the eyes, nostrils, mouth, and ears. And as they are marked with the seal, we say the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. So all these people... Even Arians, who have a faulty uh, Trinitarian theology, are received by the Second Ecumenical Council by, by the right that we know of as chrismation. And of course, you have to confess your heresy. Um, so that's one category. It continues, as for the Eunomians, who were, they were radical Arians who denied any kind of Trinitarian form. Um, as for the radical Arians, however, are baptized with a single immersion and Montanists, who are called Phrygians and Sabalian. These are really radical groups who teach that the Father and the Son are the same person, who commit other abominable things, uh, for there are many abominable things. All of them that want to adhere to orthodoxy, we're willing to accept as pagans. It says actually as Greeks, but it meant as pagans, as those who did not have any Christian background. Accordingly, on the first day, we make them Christians. On the second day, catechumens. On the third day, we exercise them with the act of blowing thrice into their faces and their ears, and we catechize them, and thus we tarry a while, and then we baptize them. So, um, by make Christians, it means they confess their intention to become Christians. That's what that means. So, basically, the second, the second group is entirely received as non-Christians and baptized. So you have two groups here in the Second Ecumenical Council, those who are chrismated uh, with, with, a, with a confession of faith and those who are 
baptized like pagans. By the 5th century, we see three categories. We had two here. By the 5th century, we have three categories established for the reception of converts into the church. And these three categories are ultimately enshrined in the ecumenical canons of the Quinisext, or the, it's called the Council in Trullo. It was a council held in the year 692 in this palace here. It, uh, this is the, the palace next to Hagia Sophia. And it was here that the fathers gathered and created these canons. And Canon 95 is considered uh, a very important summation of all the previous legislation on reception of converts. This was received as an ecumenical canon. And here's what is said. Um, our commander at Ambrose says this, summing it all up. The last word on the legislation of the church with respect to reception of orthodoxy, those coming from heresies or schisms, is Canon 95 of the Sixth Ecumenical Council in Trollo. Its first part is a verbatim repetition of Canon 7, which I just read from the Second Ecumenical Council. It merely adds a note about the need to rebaptize the followers of Paul of Samosata. It's a little aside. The second part lists the heresies that arose after the Second Ecumenical Council, like the Manichaeans, the Marcionites, and other similar heresies, in which almost nothing remained that could be called Christian, and they would receive through baptism. Nestorians and Monophysites, the followers of Eutychius and Dioscorus and Severus, were to be received through repentance and repudiation of their heresies, after which they simply would, were given Holy Communion. So, the final legislation of the church on this question should have sufficed for all future years of existence of the Orthodox Church. Without a doubt, many heresies have died out, but new ones have appeared. There was no Roman Catholic Church at the time of this council, for instance. Um, and Protestantism in all its branches was something far in the future. New and barbaric distortions of the healthy salvific teaching had not yet arisen. However, uh, Father Ambrose says... Canon 95 of this ecumenical council spells out the norms for the church's future relationship with emerging schisms and heresies, as well as by which right to receive those who would desire to become members of the church. So the, the, the formulas are laid out here. We just have to follow that, that schema. So uh, we'll, we'll, let's reiterate this. Here's what Father Ambrose says in conclusion. Those who have the, the least degree of dogmatic error can be received by way of confession of faith and communion, reputing, reputing their heresy, and then becoming orthodox. This is a photo uh, in Russia of a Catholic priest becoming orthodox. He's not chrismated at all. He simply renounces the Pope and the errors of Rome, and he's blessed with a prayer, and then he, he will be taken to the altar and declared a priest. Very interesting. right? This is not like Cyprian would say, right? Not at all. So that's, that's number one. Option number one is confession of faith and communion, according to the Council of, of Trullo. Number two, um, confession of faith and chrismation with communion. Um, others uh, would be this sort of middle group that are received by, by confession of faith, chrismation, and communion. And then there's a final group who simply are received by holy baptism, chrismation, and communion together. So there's a tripartite schema here, right? You have confession of faith, you have chrismation, and then you have the full rite of baptism. Uh, these are the, th the three different ways that are outlined. This tripartite classification, which begins in the second ecumenical council and is fully fleshed out in Quinisex, the Trollo, remains the ecumenical and traditional approach to reception of converts into the Orthodox Church because it's in the ecumenical canons of the holy ecumenical councils, right? This trumps any other theology, any other theory. This is it. This is in the canons. So, there are only two questions then that I would have in light of the weight of this ecumenical evidence. Only two questions. Number one, how do we classify current Christian bodies or schisms or heresies into this existing tripartite structure, right? Because this tripartite structure precedes in history most of the stuff that we know of as, as schismatic today, right? We don't have a lot of Donatists around anymore or Cathars, nor do we have a lot of Gnostics around. But we do have Presbyterians, and we have um, Baptists, and we have Anglicans, and we have Mormons, and we have Jehovah's Witnesses, right? We have other kinds of Christian groups now that are different. Um, so how do we classify these bodies is the first question. And the second question is, why do some Orthodox insist on rebaptism for everybody? 
So let's start with that second question, and then we'll end with the first question. So why do uh, some Orthodox insist, like this guy, on rebaptizing everybody? He's a big name on the internet, and he has, my gosh, he has like eight or nine classes on the boundaries of the church. I couldn't even watch them. They're so painful to watch. And they're long, and they're, he just goes into details, rabbit trails. It's just amazing. Um, and he's wrong about everything. I, it's just wrong. Um, but why would he argue this? What is, how is, what is his springboard, so to speak, for speaking about, um, you know, everyone has to be baptized coming into the church? Well, uh, he's drawing from a very important figure in Orthodox history who is beloved, named St. Nicodemus the Aguirite. Have you heard of him? He's a very beloved saint in Orthodoxy. He was, he was the first to articulate what we might call the theory of economia in terms of reception of converts. Uh, he was an 18th century holy man from Manathos. He was a scholar and a monk. Um, it was a trying time for Orthodoxy when we were surrounded by different, the Catholics were kind of pushing on us, and Protestant was, was new, and there's all this pressure on the church. The Turks have taken over everything uh, in the Mediterranean, and the Russians are doing their own thing, and it's a crazy time, and we're under siege in Greece, right? Our people are under siege, and, and they want to defend the faith and make, it very, make things very, very clear. And he's trying to teach the people of Greece about their faith. He emphasizes reading the scriptures. He prints gospel books and liturgy books and, and modern, modern languages, trying to help people understand. He, he creates the first collection, uh, sort of a popular collection of the holy canons with his own commentary, much of which is wrong. But it's, it's, it's a worthy effort. He's trying hard to teach the people in Greece. And he's a, a noble, holy man. Um, but, and he believed we had to pay attention to the canons because the canons are important. And uh, he emphasized this. Um, he created, he was the first churchman to create a theory that tried to, 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 to synthesize how the canons work. He wanted to have it all fit together perfectly. Uh, and so his problem was how do you bring Cyprian, remember I said Cyprian's a saint, we love him, he's a good guy. We think he was extreme about some of his views on the church. But he was a good saint. But, but Nicodemus is saying, how do we take Cyprian and make it work with the ecumenical canons that seem to contradict St. Cyprian, right? Because it clearly contradicts St. Cyprian. Are we clear on that? The canons contradict what Cyprian says. Yes, it's true. So how do you make it fit? Well, Nicodemus has this theory, which is really kind of clever. Um, his solution is to try to mitigate. So I, you've heard me talk about orthodoxy as paradoxy. He tries to mitigate the paradoxy and, and, and emphasize that, well, the truth of orthodoxy is Cyprian, and, and the canons are simply um, the fathers caving to pressure and trying to be nice. And so they, they are caving on the basis of what he calls economia. They are, they are, they, they are basically, um, the, basically, the fathers would admit that the truth is baptism only. But because of the conditions of, of the empire or the mission work of the church or the pressure of Arianism, the fathers would compromise and sort of agree that there's a sort of back door into the church that they don't really believe in. What's funny is he uses the term economia and acrivia. Acrivia means strictness. Economia means, means uh, like mercy or kind of lessening of the rule. This is, a, this is an old distinction in, in the canons. For instance, uh, I'll give you one example. So if someone commits adultery, uh, Trollo canon number 87 stipulates that there, there's seven years of excommunication, uh, provided that person repents and seeks to heal whatever it is that's been done. There's, there's seven years of penance, no communion. Well, the bishop has the, the job then of deciding to apply acrivia, which is the strictness of the rule, or if the person is repenting, to apply economia, which means maybe rather than seven years, there's a couple years or something where, where there's this, uh, the rule is lessened, so to speak. He has economia. That's a very old distinction, and that's totally fine. That's what the bishop was supposed to We pray the bishop would rightly divide the word of truth. We mean, in some sense, this, right? He has the job of deciding how to interpret the canons and apply them pastorally to save people's souls because the canons are ultimately pastoral. However, Nicodemus has the theology that the, the canons themselves are economia, which is new. This is a new idea. Even what is written in Quintessext Canon 95, 
the whole thing is economia, right? Not that you apply it with economia, the whole thing is economia, which is a new idea. So he would say, if, if you want to take the fathers seriously, understand that they don't really mean what it says in the ecumenical canons. That's sort of what he implies and what he writes. Of course, I think he's wrong on this point, and so do all the contemporary writers uh, after him, they, especially in the Russian church and, and outside of the Greek world, they think he's wrong about this. Um, but he tries really hard to make Cyprian and the canonical version fit together. And um, uh, Augustine, in his own way, did something similar earlier. Um, if, if Cyprian had this hard view, Augustine also wanted to make things fit together. And his, his approach is one that I've mentioned before. Augustine would hold to the canonical view of reception of converts. Um, but he would also say that the way around it is you have Christ as the minister of the sacrament. So Christ, baptism belongs to the church. It's of the church. It's only in the church. But if it is done in the name of Jesus in the Trinitarian form, uh, with intention to baptize, then because of Jesus' power, what happens in the sacrament outside the church makes it a valid sacrament, but not salvific until it's healed by being united back to the church. I, I bring that up because that's an interesting way around some of this stuff. Nonetheless, that is not the official Orthodox view. The Orthodox view is this. Um, we receive people into our church according to the canons, and we make no proclamation about what their church is or is not. We simply receive them and then see their baptism as healed or fulfilled or completed in the context of the communion of the Orthodox Church. So, so that was my answer in a sense to, to the question number two. Why do some Orthodox insist on rebaptism of everybody? It goes back to Nicodemus in his very novel approach where he began to articulate this new theory of economia and acrivia and apply it to the canons in this unique way which rendered the canons themselves economia. Very unusual, very strange, very novel. This tradition is only received in the Greek world, not outside the Greek world. So it's, it's a, it, it is one point of division between certain Greek writers today and, say, the Russian writers and other Orthodox around the world. I stand in the tradition of the Russian church because that was my formation, but I think the Russian church is correct on this point because, because, because this is so real, really novel. This is a new way to approach the canons that was never done before, say Nicodemus, the Agiorite. So, so to answer the second question, given the, the ancient tripartite classification, how do we break down other Christian bodies into the, the categories that match that tripartite schema? Well, let me note two things right away. Well, here's the Assembly of Bishops. Every canonical Orthodox body in North America, with the possible exception of Rokor, recognizes this tripartite approach. Even the Greeks in America recognize this tripartite way of, of classifying converts to the, to the church. You, ha you have some received by baptism, some received by confession of faith and chrismation, others simply who confess the faith and receive the Eucharist and then are Orthodox. Um, does anyone know? So the Russian church is, is very clear. You know, we just saw, we just saw this guy this priest being received by confession of faith in Russia by, a, by a, now a Russian metropolitan Ambrose of Tver. Um, so the Russians are really um, open to receiving people by other means than baptism. Why would Rokor have a different view than the Russian church? Anyone know? What really catalyzed it was, was they began to unite with the Greek old calendarists back in the 60s. And the Greek old calendars had this hard shell St. Nicodemus view and, you know, it's all baptism or, not, baptism or bust. And um, the, the Russian synod, when, when they, they adopted this theology, they acknowledged that their heritage did allow them to receive people by chrismation or confession. But they said, but that's not really good. That's, that's economia. They, 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 again, they got the Greek logic. They accepted the logic of the Greeks, of Nicodemus. And that became their approach. And to this day, even now, there's tension between Rokor and the Moscow Patriarchate over this question. There's actually... Uh, two bishops that will not serve together, one in Rokor and one in, Mo in the Moscow Patriarchate because of this question, because they, they publicly disagree over how to receive a Roman Catholic into the Orthodox Church, with the Rokor insisting they must be baptized, and, and, and the, the Russian bishops saying, no, no, do what we've always done. Uh, do it the way you just saw on the TV screen. So there's this debate even now, today, literally today, in, in, in Britain about this. So it, this is a relevant kind of question, and Rokor was kind of hijacked by radical Greek old calendarists who, who are very black and white in their theology about this. So, 
Anyway, that's the history there. And I like to, I like to tell my Russian friends that because they're just like, Rokor is really tough. I'm like, no, Rokor, they changed their views. They forsook their heritage. And the real traditional view is our view, actually. So I like to emphasize that. Okay, so every canonical body accepts this tripartite schema, number one. Number two, if we accept the three categories, there's still room to disagree about where the boundaries are precisely. So for instance, it's clear that St. Athanasius, our patron, and Basil the Great, and one of the correspondences agreed that schismatics could, in principle, be received without baptism. They agreed, but they were debating where the line was. Do you follow me? So they accept the, they accept the divisions, but they were curious and could disagree about where that line should be. So, uh, for instance, um, well, Bishop Father Alexander is, was my canon law teacher. He's now our chancellor of the OCA. Um, uh, he, he's pointed out that in our history, in America, there have been times when certain groups have been clearly in one camp, one, one of the tripartite categories, but has moved perhaps to another one. For instance, there was a time when the Episcopalians were so close to our Orthodox faith, there was talk of even just receiving them by, by, by confession of faith and bringing them in that way. However, you know, nowadays you have the liturgy of the aliens, and this is a liturgy somewhere in Europe where they're doing the altars in the middle and there's a video, they're spinning around in circles and, and they're invoking the creator, sustainer, redeemer. Is that, is that Trinitarian? Is that something we can... So the point is, there's always changes happening in groups. Some groups are becoming more extreme. Others drift more toward orthodoxy. Uh, that's probably true of like the Ethiopian and the Coptic church. What was once a very painful schism you know, I'm not saying it's not there. It still is there canonically, but, but there's a drifting together rather than a drifting apart, if that makes sense. Whereas the Episcopalians, there's a drifting apart of our faith. If that, does that make sense to you? So there's always this need to kind of readjust and reassess, and the job of that falls to the holy bishops. The bishops must make that decision uh, using the canons, using history, using pastoral considerations. All of those things would be applied as we decide, as they decide how to receive different people into the church. And that's why, to this day, when I, when I, when I, when I, when I receive someone into the church, I will consult <clears throat> the OCA clergy guidelines and be like, okay, it says you know, I'm to receive Monophysites this way, receive Baptists this way, Catholics this way. It's all right here. Um, I can read it if you want. But, um, but then I'll call the bishop up and say, hey, Vladika, I have this person coming from the Baptist tradition I'd like, I, I, I suppose I'll baptize him or her. Um, do you bless that? And he'll say yes or no, or maybe, maybe do this, do conditional baptism or something. That's another category, by the way, that we do at times not knowing for sure how to put a person into that tripartite category. We might decide to do a conditional baptism and say, if that person is not baptized, then he is baptized. That's a way kind of to acknowledge the murkiness of the situation. So as... As we get ready to close tonight, it's tempting to want to make sense of all of this, to make it all fit together perfectly, to dismiss the paradoxy of, of ecclesiology and reception of converts. Um, we might dismiss, for instance, Cyprian altogether and say, well, he's just a hardcore pain in the neck. Or, uh, you know, you know, or, or we might go the other way and say, well, it's, we're all the same. There's no, the church is not unique. And I would discourage us going in either of those directions too far. Um, St. Augustine, um, I really like what St. Augustine says. He said, he said in the 5th century, we will say boldly where the church is. Let us always say boldly, here's the church. But let us hesitate to say where it's not. I'm very comfortable with that formulation. I think that's a healthy approach. It's sane. It's, it's pastoral. I think it also recognizes that we do acknowledge some relationship with those outside the church. There's something there. We don't say what it is. We say they need the church, but there's something going on there. So it's important that we see ourselves as stewards of the life of the church and that the Orthodox Church is the church. Uh, we perceive the boundaries of the church, we might say, and yet we confess with the fathers of the councils the ways in which the church has fulfilled the baptisms of those who come from the outside into the canonical boundaries of the church. This is a great mystery. It's something we don't fully understand. Yet another reminder that the church, as Father Spremen said, is not so much an institution with mysteries, but a mystery with institutions. So let us depart with that in our, in our, in our thoughts tonight. Nicholas. Are atheists put in the same category as pagans? So if, if Isaiah becomes an atheist tomorrow, if it, he would not be an atheist. He would be an apostate atheist. 
which would be much worse. Um, is there anyone here not baptized at all? No, everyone here has been baptized from some confession or something or another. Um, l let's say you're, 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 you're Jimmy Smith down the road, never gone to church. You know, your parents are heathen. You just go to, you go to Nicholasville High School, whatever. You know, <laughs> there's no thing. You go to East Jessamine High School, right? You, you go to the local school go. where my kids go, heathens. Uh, you go there and uh, you have no religion and you're an atheist. You're just, you're just a non-Christian in my book. It's much worse, though, to me when someone is a Christian Orthodox and departs from the faith. Uh, but I would say this. Most people that I know, look, most Orthodox who are adults raised in the church have gone through a phase of spiritual darkness. So someone your age um, who has been raised in the church has a good chance to spend a week or two trying to be an atheist or an agnostic. All I would, I, I think, I, that doesn't surprise me. It happens for some people. Um, I would just hope that an Orthodox Christian would not publicly say, I'm an atheist, because that would be bad, because that would require a rite of penance. Uh, mostly what happens is people come to me and say, you know, Father, I went through a dark time. I, I, was, you know, I was sort of feeling agnostic for a while, but then I, I got hit in the head, and I'm like, no, I believe in God, and I'm here for confession. And that's how, that's how it's resolved most of the time. And, you know, and, and, and I just talk to them and, and pray with them and offer them absolution. They usually return to communion pretty quickly. But if someone stands up and says, I'm an atheist, that's a little different. And the canons would treat, the holy canons would treat them like an apostate. So don't do that. What would you say is the difference between heresy and schism? There's a debate about that. So even in the canons, they're inconsistent. So um, I, this struck me preparing for this tonight. Like, like Cyprian says, if you're a heretic, you're just out. Um, but, and Augustine will say, well, heresy is really bad, but schism isn't. Or, schisms, they're all bad, but like schism is easily healed, heresy is not. I think in contemporary times, there's a debate about, um, Father Hopka would often say, we should really rarely use heresy. We should simply say they're not orthodox, because very few people have rejected orthodoxy. They just don't know orthodoxy. And so it's hard, you can't even call a Baptist a heretic. You can say the Baptist theology is heretical, because it really is a it really is a departure from orthodoxy in a way that, that say the Roman Catholic Church is not. It's it's way farther, you might say. So you you could call it a heresy maybe in that sense, but we wouldn't we would hesitate to call someone a, a heretic. Um, but a, a heresy would imply a, a, a deformation of the gospel of a higher degree than schism. Schism would imply just a breach in communion. So w w what exists between between the Russian Church and the Greek Church today? is a schism, not, I don't think a her full-blown heresy, though there's maybe heretical ideas mixed in. The debate would be, is Rome heresy or schism? And I think there's room to argue both ways. Um, th they certainly have teachings that are heretical, uh, we would say, but, you know, it's a question of degree. Does that make sense? So some of the doctors say they're definitely heretics, others say no, they're schismatic. And I, I can see both sides of that. I'm Father Justin Patterson. Thank you for watching our Intro to Orthodoxy series. We're really glad you're joining us for this. We invite you to engage with us in person. Come visit our parish. Come see, taste and see that the Lord is good by visiting our community. Also, take advantage of our website, our YouTube channel, and all the contact information that you'll find on the screen. Thank you very much, and may God bless you.